Aubrey Reich, now a police sergeant, was an ambulance attendant in November 1963. Who put the, the president's body into the coffin? Uh, Dennis McGuire and myself lifted him and placed him in the casket. Paul O'Connor, now a retired police officer, then a Navy medical technician. He met the coffin several hours later at the Bethesda morgue. The door came open, in came the casket. I sat right next to the, the uh, autopsy table. We opened up the casket, and I was right there, and I just helped lift the front part of his uh, you know, body up and put it on the table. Tell me about this casket. It was a uh, bronze, uh, self-sealing casket. Yeah, it was either gray on pink or pink on gray casket. It was a very expensive casket. Just a plain casket. Is that what they call a shipping casket? I've heard that. Well, uh, yeah. Uh, it's, it wasn't a big ceremonial casket. Dennis David was also there when the coffin carrying JFK arrived at Bethesda Hospital. This casket that you were carrying... It was a gray... I didn't carry it, but the men I took down carried it. It was just a gray casket. Gray metal... A metal shipping casket. Nothing ornate, nothing... In it. it definitely wasn't the fancy casket that they showed on TV, which I saw later on. You mean Somebody it wasn't said. this casket? This is the one that he was loaded onto the plane? No, ma'am, it wasn't that casket. It was just a plain gray shipping casket. You sure? I'm positive. Did it surprise you later to see the photographs of this big bronze casket? Yes. I, I, of course, you got to understand, I didn't see that picture until years later. I'm going, I said to myself, well, wait a minute. That's not the one that came in the, the morgue that night. This wasn't the one. If the caskets carrying the president were different, there are also opposing versions of how JFK's body was wrapped. And we knew that the blood was going to get into the casket, so we took a sheet, a rubber sheet, plastic sheet, you know, like they use for bedwetting type situations, and we lined the casket with this sheet. When you opened the casket, did you see his body immediately? No, he's in a body bag. A body bag? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's like a crash bag. You mean like something like this? Is this the sort of thing you're talking about? Well, uh, just about it's the same color, matter of fact, as I can remember. Now, Mr. O'Connor says that the president's body was in a body bag like this. Did he leave Dallas in a body bag? He didn't leave Parkland Hospital in a body bag. And that's the last time I touched the president. I, we, we wouldn't use, I would hope we wouldn't use, you know, a crash bag to put the president's body in. I, I would hope it wouldn't come down to that. Uh, well, did you? No. No way. We lined the casket with a rubber sheet. I knew a body bag from the bed liner. I'm not sure it was a, it was a body bag. This gray Navy ambulance carried the coffin that was supposed to contain the president's body. But, says Dennis David, this was not the ambulance he met. It was a black ambulance, or a, some people would call a hearse, but it was a black, like a hearse, an ambulance. And Dennis David says the black ambulance with JFK's body got to the morgue well before Jackie Kennedy, the official motorcade, and the bronze coffin. I watched the motorcade come up miss it and then of course it you know i could see it come through the windows and then i saw it pull up out front you could look down through when she came in uh i didn't think anything about it at the moment but later on when uh, they were talking about that she was escorting the body uh, that's kind of funny because you know the body was already back in the morgue before when she pulled up there i don't know how it got from dallas to naval medical center but it got there before, before Mrs. Kennedy did, a good 15, 20 minutes before. Gerald Custer's job that night was to take x-rays of JFK's body. He says he had already taken a set of x-rays by the time Jackie Kennedy arrived. I was in the morgue, took a set of films, went up to the main entrance. Who was coming through the main entrance? But Jacqueline Kennedy. And I found out later that was supposedly she had come in with the president's body. So how could that be the president's body when I, the president's body was already in the morgue half an hour? If JFK's body did leave Dallas in one coffin and arrive at Bethesda Hospital morgue in another coffin, what was going on? 
The answer is we don't know. The explanations being offered are every bit as bizarre as the tale of the two coffins. For example, author David Lifton, whom we hired as a consultant for this report, he was the first to reveal the story of the two coffins and believes JFK's body was hijacked and surgically altered to hide evidence that more than one gunman fired at the president. The body did not make an uninterrupted journey between Dallas and Bethesda. That means there was an opportunity to alter the body. Lifton believes that while Jackie Kennedy was watching Lyndon Johnson being sworn as president in the midsection of Air Force One, JFK's body could have been removed from the bronze coffin in another part of the plane and hidden in the luggage compartment. Then, says Lifton, after Air Force One landed at Andrews Air Force Base, and while the nation watched the empty coffin being unloaded, the president's body was quietly taken off the plane through a rear entrance. But was it a plot or a security measure designed to protect the president's body? I interviewed General Chester Clifton in the summer of 1980. Clifton, who was military aide to the president and who made the arrangements by radio for the autopsy, said there was no security measures, no decoy ambulance was used or anything of the sort, that he knew of nothing of the sort. He would have to know if there was a security measure, he would be the person who would actually be implementing such a measure. He denies it. Wasn't there somebody with a coffin at all times? The coffin was always in the custody of a group of Secret Service agents and a Navy Rear Admiral. So, if anything happened between Dallas and Bethesda, and if the body was taken out of one coffin and put somewhere else on the plane, or put into another coffin, or into a body bag, the presumption is that it didn't happen by magic, and knowledge of that has to be known by some of those agents and or that Navy Admiral. Are you accusing them of being involved in a conspiracy? No, I'm not, because I don't know who exactly has the knowledge. The Secret Service agents involved have stated they maintain constant vigilance over JFK's body through the entire trip, and the body could not have been removed from the bronze coffin. But the witnesses, men who were close to JFK's body that night in Dallas and Bethesda, are certain about what they saw. Your memory is real clear. It's clear enough to know that I did not participate in putting the president's body in a body bag. Do you think that it's possible after 25 years that you could be mistaken? No. no. I can't tell you what I did the next day or the day before, but that particular day, uh, I don't know, you know, it isn't every day you get an assassinated president come in, I guess. <laughs> but uh, no, I, I, I have no qualms about my memory in that. I'm positive that that's what it was. As with so many questions in the assassination, we may never know why there were two coffins for JFK. That's partly because for years, key witnesses, many of them Navy men, were under orders to remain silent. Well, they called us into uh, the commanding officer's office. And when I say they, I'm talking about the autopsy team, the people that worked either directly or indirectly with it, and had us sign orders stating that we wouldn't talk under penalty of general court martial and I can't remember the, the exact text of the uh, order, but what they said is, keep your mouth shut. And that I did. Some witnesses were simply afraid. We were, we were scared, let's face it. There was a lot of us that were afraid because we also you know, read about other individuals involved with uh, the Kennedy in one way or another who died mysterious deaths or were assassinated or died mysteriously. Do you still think you might be taking a risk? Yes. Why do you do it? Because my family's grown and I've gotten older and I don't know that uh, I've been through Vietnam and I don't know that it, it doesn't scare me anymore. Uh, basically, uh, what I'm saying is if you want to do something about it, here I am, to hell with you. Because I'm not afraid anymore. I think it's a damn shame that uh, there isn't more information released on it and that the public has never gotten the full story. I wish it would come out before I die. I'd like to know exactly what happened to it. 25 years later, exactly what happened is still in dispute. Next, the controversy over a magic bullet. Under of an argument as old as the assassination itself. An argument over whether more than one person fired at JFK. In the government version, it was one of the bullets that hit the president during the last six seconds of his life. 
The Warren Commission said Lee Harvey Oswald was the only shooter. That he used this rifle to fire three times from the sixth floor of the Texas School Book Depository, killing the president and wounding then Texas Governor John Connolly. David Bellin was a counsel to the Warren Commission. The bullet that struck President Kennedy, which partially disintegrated, two portions of that bullet were ballistically identifiable and were shown to have come from Oswald's rifle to the exclusion of all of the weapons in the world, and that rifle was found on the sixth floor of the Texas School Book Depository building, where the cartridge cases were also found by the assassination window, the three cartridge cases, which ballistically came from Oswald's rifle. But there was a problem. FBI sharpshooters test-fired Oswald's rifle, a Mannlicher Carcano like this one. They established it took at least 2.3 seconds between shots. Time to shoot, work the bolt, and shoot again. And that doesn't allow time to aim. Film of the assassination taken by Abraham Zapruder shows that there was too short an interval between the hits on Kennedy and Connolly. 1.6 seconds. Oswald could not have fired his rifle that quickly. Since they were wounded in less time than it took to fire the rifle twice, um, there had to be a second gun firing to account for that, those two men being wounded in such a short period of time, unless one bullet went through both victims. Which brings us back to the bullet in question. The Warren Commission and the House Assassination Committee said it had, in fact, passed through both Kennedy and Connolly. It's known as the single bullet theory. Well, the single bullet theory is sheer, absolute, unadulterated nonsense. Cyril Wecht, coroner of Allegheny County, Pennsylvania, says the single bullet could not possibly have done the following. You had the bullet coming out of John Kennedy, moving then downward and to the left, and yet it slams into John Connolly behind the right armpit. Well, Connolly was sitting directly in front of Kennedy. So you've got to have the bullet coming out of Kennedy, stopping abruptly in midair, turning to the right, coming back about 20 inches, stopping again, turning around now to the left, and going into Connolly. And then after it goes into Connolly, it now moves at a downward angle of 45 degrees, whereas in Kennedy, it had a downward angle of 7 degrees. So that's the single bullet theory. It is better than any roller coaster ride that anybody has ever seen anywhere in the world. It is a bullet that rightfully deserves the characterization that we critics have given to it, a magic bullet. As uh, articulate and intelligent as Dr. Wecht is, He's wrong. Dr. Michael Bodden worked with Dr. Wecht on the House Assassinations Committee, where Wecht was in the minority. Whenever we try to line up entrance and exits of bullets, there are always a, a million ways in which it couldn't have happened, and one way in which it could happen. The president and the governor were moving at the time. They were waving to the crowd at the time that the um, bullet was fired. And there was one millisecond when there was an alignment of the two bodies that permitted this trajectory to happen. But there are conflicting versions of the trajectory, the angles at which the president and Connolly were shot. This Warren Commission exhibit shows the bullet passing through JFK at one angle, while this Secret Service drawing indicates that the bullet that hit Connolly entered at a quite different angle. And critics of the official version, like San Francisco private detective Josiah Thompson, argue that the Sapruder film proves that Kennedy and Connolly were hit by different bullets. For a very short period of time, the president and Connolly and most of the limousine is obscured by a sign between the, that obscured it to Sapruder's camera. So we don't see the impact on Kennedy. What we see are the effects of that impact. And when, when the limousine emerges from behind the sign, we see Kennedy's hands coming up in this fashion with fists closed splayed upward in this position and that happens approximately a, a second any anywhere from a second and a half to three quarters of a second before we see the impact of the bullet on Connolly we see Connolly turn to his right we see his shoulder driven down we see his cheeks puff dramatically, and we see his hair be dislodged. And clearly that had to have been a separate shot. Governor Connolly agreed he was not struck by the same bullet that hit Kennedy. I am 
convinced beyond any question of a doubt that the first shot that was fired did not hit me. Then I was hit. As persuasive as Governor Connolly is, I can't find anybody at that time who was more persuasive and more honorable in giving testimony as to what happened at the time of the shooting, he was wrong. As far as the which bullet struck him. Government tests of these bullet fragments from Governor Connolly's wrist are used to support the single bullet theory. The tests concluded that it was, quote, highly likely, end quote, that the fragments did match the single bullet, the bullet fired from Oswald's rifle, the bullet that's supposed to have gone through both Kennedy and Connolly. But Dr. Wecht points out that the government's tests were highly selective. Even if they prove to be valid, they are in no way complete. That is a fact of record that they did not test all the fragments. The fragments in the president's body, the fragments in Connolly's chest, and obviously that is a thing that would have to be done because if you're talking about the possibility of more than one bullet, then you have to determine whether or not there are fragments from other bullets. A critical question, just where was the president struck? The Warren Commission drawing showed the wound to be high enough on JFK's body to exit downward through the throat and hit Connolly. But bullet holes in the president's suit coat and shirt seemed to be too low for that. The Warren Commission concluded the president's jacket and shirt must have ridden up his back as he waved to the crowd. But in this shooting reenactment in 1964, FBI agents placed the wound too low to exit through the throat. So did the doctors who drew this autopsy diagram. But then they noted in the margin they'd made a mistake and moved the wound higher on JFK's body. It looks like there was a hole in the body and a hole in the clothing that sort of matched that night at Bethesda, and that wound was raised by the time the official autopsy was written that weekend so that that hole could provide the entry point for a downward slanting trajectory, which would then come out at the hole at the front of the throat there is evidence that contrary to the official version, the bullet may not have passed through the president's body at all. Evidence that emerged at the autopsy. 25 years ago, the autopsy room at Bethesda was in the area of this cafeteria. The autopsy, the detailed physical examination of the corpse, is often the most important piece of evidence in a murder. But there are charges that the autopsy performed here on the president of the United States was seriously deficient. Dr. Cyril Wecht says one critical deficiency was an order to the autopsy doctors not to establish the path of the bullets through the body. They were instructed not to do certain things by the FBI people and an admiral and a general who were in the autopsy room that night. They were told, for example, not to trace out the bullet wound in the back, not to trace out the hole through the part of the president's neck. Dr. James Humes performed the autopsy and found a peculiar bullet wound in the president's back. The FBI report on the autopsy said the end of the opening made by the bullet could be felt with the finger and, quote, there was no point of exit and the bullet was not in the body, end quote. Then came a phone call from Parkland Hospital in Dallas. This bullet had been found on a stretcher there. The night of the autopsy, Dr. Humes is observed by the FBI sticking his finger in there and saying that it doesn't go anywhere, it terminates. And therefore, he, and about that time, the phone rings in the autopsy room, and the Secret Service chief is calling one of his agents to the phone and tells him to tell Humes that they've found a bullet on a stretcher. Essentially, the dialogue goes like this. They've got a wound, you've got a wound without a bullet, we've got a bullet without a wound, and so the match is made in the autopsy room, and Humes, provided with this information, says, oh, the pattern is clear. This bullet, which I'm being told about in this telephone call, must have fallen out this hole in the back, which doesn't seem to go anywhere. So at the autopsy, doctors concluded that the bullet that was supposed to have hit both Kennedy and Connolly had not even passed through Kennedy's body. But a few days later, when Dr. Humes handed in his written autopsy report, it stated the bullet had gone through JFK's body, contradicting that report by the FBI. In front of the FBI, Humes said that... It, he couldn't, it, it terminated. He could feel the end of the hole with his finger. The main difference between Friday night and a few days later when he turns in the autopsy report 
is that when he turns in the report, he says the bullet passed all the way through the body and exited at the wound at the front of the throat. The most persistent question about the single bullet, known as Warren Commission Exhibit 399, how could it cause seven wounds to JFK and Governor Connolly with so little damage to the bullet? The entire copper jacket of the bullet is intact. The nose, the cone of the bullet, which under the single bullet theory broke two bones in John Connolly, rib and wrist, that is completely intact, doesn't even show the slightest indentation. That's impossible. The bullet itself is designed to, to go through um, uh, heavy bones very easily. It is a very tough, heavy bullet meant for war purposes to kill your enemy and to kill anybody who might be next to your, en your enemy, you know, to go through him and go to the next guy. So uh, the small amount of deformity is entirely consistent with the, uh, with the bone deformity, remembering, and maybe people don't understand, when a bullet goes through a body, the only thing that's going to cause it to deform will be striking a bone. If it doesn't strike a bone, it doesn't get deformed. This bullet struck a bone fired by the FBI into the wrist of a cadaver. And the bullets that broke the wrist of a human cadaver show tremendous mushrooming, peeling back effect that you expect to find when a bullet impacts against dense bone. For years, Wecht has demanded tests to confirm that a bullet like the single bullet can be fired through bone and remain intact. How much would it cost? What kind of an effort would it be for the federal government, in this case, to get together the rifle and some bullets to get some goat carcasses and to get some human cadavers. Shooting a cadaver would be better than shooting the experiments that were done shooting bones, but shooting a living tissue is different than shooting dead tissue. The blood going through the skin, the, the vitality of the skin affects how the bullet is going to deform the underlying bone. So one can never quite reproduce the, the um, um, path of the bullet you come up with one bullet that will be pristine, like Commission Exhibit 399, the stretcher bullet that has gone through the wrist of a human cadaver, let alone two bones like the stretcher bullet must have done under the single bullet scenario, and that will end my criticism. Next, the question of a shot from the grassy knoll. John F. Kennedy caught in a crossfire was more than one person shooting. What does the film taken by Abraham Zapruder actually show? Did the fatal shot to the head come from the rear, from Lee Harvey Oswald's rifle in the Texas School Book Depository? Or was another assassin firing from the front, from the grassy knoll overlooking Dealey Plaza? It seems much more plausible that there was a shot from the rear that caused the head wound. The shot from the front, which was only 50 feet away, struck the president, killed him. President Kennedy was struck by two bullets, and only two bullets, from behind. He was hit with a bullet, fired from the right front, from this general area of the grassy knoll, stockade fence. The stockade fence. Critics of the Warren Commission have long cited evidence that someone was shooting from behind the fence. Shortly after the shooting, a Dallas patrolman, Joe Marshall Smith, ran up into that area with his gun out. He surprised two men in the bushes, who then showed him Secret Service credentials. No Secret Service agents were in that area. A whole crowd of witnesses ran up the grassy knoll toward the fence, many saying they were certain that a shot had come from there. S.M. Holland was one of several witnesses who saw a puff of smoke near the fence. And one of those shots came from behind that picket fence. And there's no doubt in my mind, I never will be. Because I was on the spot, I saw the smoke, heard the report, and saw the smoke behind that fence. There is physical evidence of a shot from the front. Robert Groden, a Warren Commission critic for many years and photo expert for the House Assassinations Committee. At the point of impact on the president, skull, brain were blown to the rear. Motorcycle policeman to the left rear of the president was splattered with such force and such power, he himself thought he had been hit by a bullet. It was that powerful. A piece of the occipital bone was blown 35 feet to the rear and left of the point of impact. It was recovered by Billy Harper, a, a witness. 
Grodin believes Jackie Kennedy climbed onto the trunk of the limousine for a reason that is not generally understood. After the president was hit, she was looking at his head. You can see it in the Zapruder film. She was looking right at him as he was struck. She saw a piece of his head blown to the rear onto the trunk of the car. She turns around, climbs onto the trunk, braces herself with her left hand, reaches out, and pulls in a piece of the president's head that was blown to the rear, brings it back into the car, and attempts to hold it back on, to, to, to fix it, to put it together. In this panic moment to try to, to try to try to make it all right somehow. Her testi the testimony about what she said was, they've killed my husband, I have his brains in my hand. Dr. Marion Jenkins, one of the doctors who tried to save JFK at Parkland Hospital, encounter Jackie Kennedy in the emergency room. She was, uh, in the first part of it, uh, carrying her hands like this. And uh, on one of her times in, I can't tell you how many times she was in, she nudged me with her elbow and handed me what she had in her hand. It was part of his brain. In her own testimony before the Warren Commission, which was suppressed and not released until the 1972 Freedom of Information Act suit, she says, from the rear, you know, you were trying to hold his hair on and his skull on. She was describing an exit wound in the rear of the president's head. The location of the head wound is key evidence. Since a bullet almost always makes a small wound when it enters and a large wound when it exits, a big wound at the back of JFK's head would indicate a shot from the front, and more than one shooter. Most of the doctors and nurses who treated the president at Parkland did see a large wound at the rear of the head. Dr. Robert McClelland. It was in the right back part of the head, very large. Nurse Audrey Bell. All, there was a massive wound at the back of his head. Dr. Charles Carrico. There was a... Uh... A, a large, uh, quite a large defect about here on his, on his skull. Dr. Ronald Jones. Well, my impression was that, that there was a wound in, in this area of the head, right in, right in this area. Andrew Purdy was counsel to the House Assassinations Committee. He says the Dallas doctors are wrong. When you think of the body as being face up, and you think particularly in Dallas of the amount of blood that was involved there, People couldn't distinguish where things were. It must have been a terrible, tragic sight. It was very hard for people to recollect exactly where what was when that wasn't their purpose. Their purpose was to save the president's life, and these recollections afterwards are faulty. But six of the Dallas doctors testified they saw a part of the brain called the cerebellum protruding from the president's head wound. The cerebellum is located at the extreme back of the head. And a portion of the cerebellum fell out onto the table as we were doing the, uh, the tracheostomy. It did. Mm -hmm. So the wound was very far back here. Right. The cerebellum was not protruding. We examined the cerebellum uh, by pho pho photographically, and it was intact. That's one of my more vivid memories, I would say, of the whole thing. Was that was particularly uh, grim to see that portion of the brain ooze out of the wound as I sat there looking at it, stood there looking at it. So that stays with you pretty, pretty much. But now, some of the Dallas doctors, like Marion Jenkins, are changing their stories. As late as 1977, Jenkins was saying he had seen the cerebellum protruding from JFK's head wound, meaning the wound was far to the rear. But recently, Jenkins had his first look at the official photos and x-rays. Well, after looking at photo photographs, some made from this angle, looking down at the top of the head, it did look like cerebellum. <laughs> it still looks like it, but it's obviously not. I'm not trying to defend it. I've made an error, and I've been, but I say I make errors. I call my kids with the wrong names. Through the years, they never changed their story. Now, all of a sudden, they're doing it because it's for the public record? I can't buy that. I can't accept that. The Dallas doctor's recollections about an exit wound in the back of the president's head are confirmed by witnesses at the Bethesda Hospital autopsy. I mean, a big gaping hole in the back of the head. 
Floyd Reby, a photographer on duty, talked with Wayne Friedman. So it's like somebody put a piece of dynamite in a tin can and light it off. There was nothing there. Open area all the way across into the rear of the, the brain like that. From the top of the head almost back to the near the base of the skull. You could see where that part was gone. So eyewitnesses in Dallas and Bethesda describe a wound extending all the way to the back of the head. But official autopsy photos and x-rays move the wound all the way to the front of the head. The photos show the back of the head with hair and scalp intact. No large wound. The x-rays show a large wound extending to the forehead. Certainly I can tell you that the wound was not here. There was no damage to the face. Uh, that was visible. The wound was where it's evident on the x-rays and the photographs. And the wound was basically in this kind of an area, which is above the forehead. And that's where it was. The autopsy photographs, which I've worked with, which I've seen several times since the late 1970s, absolutely show a totally different set of wounds, especially in the rear of the head. The one in the rear of the head is absolutely nowhere near what any of the doctors described. The point is, people who say President Kennedy was shot from the front say there was a gigantic hole in the back of the president's head. If there was a gigantic hole in the back of the president's head, there must have been a tremendous conspiracy of massive proportions to alter the body, the autopsy photographs, and x-rays to change all that evidence. Our experts say that there was no such conspiracy. But remember the witnesses whose story indicates JFK's body was intercepted between Dallas and Bethesda, switched from one coffin to another, and wrapped differently. We lined the casket with a rubber sheet. I knew a body bag from a bed liner. I'm not sure it was a, it was a body bag. We determined that whatever may have happened to the body bag in the coffin, nothing was done to tamper with the body itself, except for what was done by the treating physicians at Parkland Hospital. No skull surgery was done by the Parkland doctors. Yet at Bethesda Hospital, two FBI agents observing the president's autopsy reported, quote, it was apparent that a tracheotomy had been performed, as well as surgery of the head area, namely in the top of the skull. Medical technician O'Connor says when he looked at JFK's body, something was missing. My job was to remove brain and there was no brain to be removed. It was all gone. The official autopsy report contains a description of the brain O'Connor says wasn't there and says it was preserved in formaldehyde. It is not um, a, a, a matter that can simply be mistaken by, by the pathologist, whereas I think lots of things can be mistaken by uh, attendants who have no training as, as pathologists. Just because they hang out with pathologists, just because they hang out in the autopsy room, just because they are absolutely certain in their own mind that the brain wasn't present, doesn't mean that's valid. In order to remove the brain from the, from the skull, you, you have to cut the top of the skull off and then remove the brain. And that wasn't done. We didn't even touch the skull. We didn't have to. Why not? Well, there's no brain in there to take out. Adding to the mystery, the brain mentioned in official reports is missing from the National Archives after being turned over to Robert Kennedy in 1965. David Lifton argues the president's body was hijacked and altered to hide evidence of the large wound at the back of the head. The key to this whole thing is the autopsy because the autopsy is the diagram of the shooting. It's the body that's the diagram of the shooting. So you either have to have in the autopsy room someone who's willing to lie to the investigators or the body has to lie to the doctors. And I think this is a situation in which the body was made to lie to the doctors. What about the official photos and x-rays? We showed them to the three eyewitnesses to JFK's autopsy. Photos and x-rays not available to the public since the assassination, but recently obtained by the press. Gerald Custer took the x-rays that night. Is this the x-ray picture that you took? And is this the wound that you saw on the president? This area here was gone. Not this area. Not this area. Floyd Reby assisted with the autopsy photos. The two pictures that I've seen that you showed me that are supposedly from the archives are not what I saw that night. Now, I don't know where those pictures came from. 
the back of the head look like that? What did the back uh -huh. of the head look like? It had a big hole in it. This whole area was gone. Does that look like what you saw? No, no, it doesn't look like what I saw. This, this would be uh, a lesser of a wound than what I saw. I saw a, a lot worse wound uh, that extended way back into this area here. Was the president's hair and scalp like that? No. What was it like? This part of the head was gone. There was no scalp there. Are you telling me that this is not I don't believe so. You, you don't think this is an no. honest-to-God no. autopsy photo? No, I don't. What do you think it is? I don't know. It's being phonied someplace. It's make-believe. The one remaining category of doubt relates to what should be the best evidence the body of the slain president. Controversial evidence about the body of the president has been the focus of a new critical approach developed by David Lifton. The Dallas doctors. His investigation led to a thoroughly researched book published after Congress re-examined the assassination. What part of the brain? Lifton found new evidence about the autopsy and new evidence from eyewitnesses whom he filmed. This led him to a provocative conclusion. What is very clear is that the president's body did not make an uninterrupted journey from Dallas to Bethesda. It began in a large ceremonial casket. It was placed in that casket by Aubrey Reich of the O'Neill Funeral Home. I helped put President Kennedy's body in a bronze ceremonial casket on November 22, 1963 at Parker Memorial Hospital. He wrapped the body in sheets. It was placed in the casket. The bronze casket was placed on board Air Force One. This was not the casket from which Kennedy's body was removed by Bethesda autopsy technician Paul O'Connor. We opened the pinkish gray uh, shipping casket, and there was a gray body bag zip, yeah. zip shut. We unzipped the body bag, and the president's body was lifted out of the, of the body bag. Reich told Lifton that Kennedy's body was not in a body bag when it left Dallas. How could he be so certain? I remember, I remember picking him up. I, I was the one that, that had the blood on my shirt and everything from the, the body. If he'd been in a crash bag, you couldn't have got any blood on him because it's a sealed bag. Was the large bronze casket empty when it was unloaded at Bethesda, as Lifton argues? The Secret Service refused to comment for Nova. But an Air Force officer claims the body could not have been switched because the casket was in his view for all but five minutes of the journey from Dallas to Bethesda. But after the body arrived at Bethesda Naval Hospital for the autopsy, many problems followed. The autopsy should have determined how the gunshots killed Kennedy and where the bullets entered and exited his body. Dr. James Humes, a Naval Hospital pathologist, not a forensic expert, was in charge. This was his first autopsy involving gunshot wounds. It resulted in many irregularities. He did not examine Kennedy's clothing to locate and confirm entry and exit wounds. He did not dissect the neck wound to trace the bullet's path through the body. He did not locate the wounds with reference to fixed body landmarks. And he apparently made errors of several inches in drawings locating the wounds. He did not properly examine the brain, which disappeared some years later and has not been found since. He didn't realize there was a bullet wound in the front of the neck until he contacted the Dallas doctors the following day. By then, the body had been removed and re-examination was impossible. And finally, he burned his original autopsy notes before they were made public. Compounding these problems, the autopsy descriptions of the wounds were substantially different from the way the doctors in Dallas described them, as David Lipton explains. We have two groups of doctors seeing the body, which is evidence. Their observations are six hours apart. What did they see in each area of the body? In the area of the neck, President Kennedy 
suffered a wound in Dallas, which was described as an entry wound. If Kennedy was shot from behind, the wound on the front of his neck had to be an exit wound. But that's not what nurse Audrey Bell, on duty in the emergency room that day, recalls. It looked small and round, like an entry wound, instead of larger, like an exit wound could uh, often look. The, the wound was about five millimeters or a quarter inch across, the size of a pencil, right at the throat, at the Adam's apple. That wound, Dr. Perry made a tracheotomy through. Lifton claims he was told by the Dallas doctor who made the tracheotomy that his incision through the neck wound was smooth and less than half the width described by Dr. Humes, the autopsy doctor. More significantly, he describes it as having widely gaping irregular edges. So the inconsistency here is that we have a widening of a wound, which in Dallas was thought to be a bullet's entry. At Bethesda, in the autopsy report, their conclusion is that this is the exit for a bullet which entered from behind. The records on Kennedy's head wound, the one that killed him, also seem to be inconsistent, both in terms of size and location. Six of the Dallas doctors, including the neurosurgeon who pronounced Kennedy dead, said the cerebellum was visible through the hole in the skull. But according to the autopsy, the wound was not at the bottom and back of his head, where the cerebellum is located. In fact, in this drawing, we see only a small entry wound at this location. The drawing, based on an autopsy photo of the back of Kennedy's head, was made public by Congress and seems inconsistent with this drawing showing the size and location of what critics point out looks like a large exit wound. The drawing was approved by Dr. McClellan, one of the attending physicians in Dallas based on the absence of any evidence coming from the Dallas end of the line that there were rear entries on the body, I conclude that President Kennedy was shot from the front. This document led Lifton to conclude the wounds had been altered. It's a report written by two FBI agents who attended the autopsy. Their report states it was apparent that surgery of the head area was done before the autopsy started. Had surgery been done in Dallas? No, there was no surgery done on the president's head. The president was only treated in the trauma room, in the emergency room. This autopsy sketch done in Bethesda shows the head wound almost five times larger than the description given by a doctor in the Dallas medical team, further evidence to Lifton of an altered wound. If the wound was altered, Lifton believes it was to get access to Kennedy's brain. The brain had the bullets. That's the reason for getting access to the brain. The reason for altering the body is that the body is the diagram of the shooting, and it's the most important evidence in the case. Uh, I infer the purpose of doing it from the effect it has. Someone wants to make it appear in the evidence that President Kennedy was struck twice from behind from the direction of the school book depository building and to obliterate any evidence of frontal entry. That's my opinion about what these facts mean. The autopsy doctor refused to be interviewed by Nova, but four of the doctors who treated Kennedy in Dallas agreed to come to the National Archives to examine photos of the president's body at the time of his autopsy. Perhaps they could corroborate or disprove Lipton's explosive claims of altered wounds. Would their recollection of the wounds match the photos they would be seeing for the first time? Let me show you to my best recollection what the wound looked like to me that day in trauma room one. Before each doctor looked at the photos, he described the wounds he had seen back in 1963. I could see the president's uh, head wound quite well, and um, I was probably looking into a wound that was on the lateral or the side part of the head and the back part of the head. Uh, it would be this portion of the head right here. As I remember, it's like this, that there was a big wound, big deficit in his skull, and the temporal parietal area. Would you come in, please? The examination of the 52 color and black and white autopsy photos by the doctors for Nova was unprecedented. Special permission had to be obtained from the Kennedy family to arrange this. 
Cameras were barred from the room in which the doctors looked at the pictures. Each took as much time as he felt necessary to examine them, from 30 minutes to a full hour. I would have to say, uh, honestly, in looking at these photos, they're pretty much as I remember President Kennedy at the time, except for that little incision that seems to be coming down in the parietal area. Uh, on looking at the photographs, I could envision that an incision might have been made in order to pull the scalp back to expose this bone to make a photograph of that area. Perhaps this explains the surgery to the head area the FBI mentioned. I, I would have to say, uh, honestly, in looking at these photos, they're pretty much as I remember President Kennedy at the time, except for that little incision that seems to be coming down in the parietal area. Uh, on looking at the photographs, I could envision that an incision might have been made in order to pull the scalp back to expose this bone to make a photograph of that area. Perhaps this explains the surgery to the head area the FBI mentioned. First story on JFK, the man, the movie, the murder mystery. With us tonight, Robert Sam Anson wrote that cover story for Esquire magazine. He wrote a book about the Kennedy assassination in 1975 as well. David Lifton's book, Best Evidence, got the case into the New York Times bestseller list, and his theories on what happened to JFK's corpse after the assassination have broken important new ground. Carl Oglesby is head of the Assassination Information Bureau in Boston, and Carl is an expert on the political aspects of JFK's death. Robert Groden was the chief consultant for a recent British TV series called The Men Who Killed Kennedy. He's a professional photo analyst who's made much of the photographic evidence on the assassination. Uh, he's made it public, that is, or at least available to the public. Welcome to you all. Thank you all for being here. I should, uh, David, this is your book, Best Evidence, and, uh, and Robert, high treason from you, and that takes care of the book plugs for the evening. <laughs> all right, let's... Uh, Let's start with the event itself and then sort of move out concentrically. It, it is about 12.30 p.m. on November 22nd, 1963. We're in Dallas, Texas. The president has just made a rather odd little bend in his motorcade route. He enters Dealey Plaza and shots are fired. Fortunately, there's a lot of photographic and film evidence as well as eyewitness accounts. What does that evidence tell us happened? How many shots, who was firing, that sort of thing. We've been fighting about that ever since it happened. Uh, if, uh, if only there had been a, a few more photographs, a few more films, maybe we could have pinned it down. If only there had been an autopsy in Dallas uh, instead of the removal of the body under certain peculiar circumstances to Washington. Uh, but the fact is that for all the eyewitnesses, for all the photographic and other kinds of evidence, it's still a mystery as to what happens. Of course, the government says that there were three shots fired, one of them missed, one of them hit both the president and Governor Connolly, the so-called single, single bullet or magic bullet theory. And then a third shot uh, hit Kennedy in the head and uh, clearly was fatal. Mm -hmm. Look, it's the central thesis of my book and uh, central to what I think happened that President Kennedy's body was secretly altered between the time of the shooting at 1230 and the time of the autopsy. Okay. And it's the alterations that have confused the issue and prevented us from knowing the truth and make Oswald look guilty. Okay, I want to get law. to the autopsy in a bit, but let's yeah. just, let's stay in Dealey Plaza just for the moment. Uh, Robert, you've made a great study of the Zapruder film, the Abraham Zapruder film, which many of us have seen, and unfortunately it was too expensive for us to get a hold of for the show. <laughs> what does that seem to demonstrate about the number of shots? Mm. Well, the Zapruder film is in fact a clock for the assassination. Uh, it creates what I like to refer to as salami slices of time. You can tell what happens from the evaluation of the film, each frame running about an eighteenth of a second from the one before or after it. And given the responses of both men and uh, aligning the film with the acoustics tape that was made quite by accident by the Dallas Police Department, you end up with a, a relatively uh, accurate uh, scenario of the events. Uh, that is that more than one person was firing because the Zapruder film also shows us 
the spaces between the shots. And because of that, we know that the capability of Lee Harvey Oswald's rifle was not fast enough to have fired the shots that quickly. There had to be at least a second assassin, based on the photographic evidence alone. Mm -hmm. There is also a lot of eyewitness testimony. Do you find it compelling? The eyewitness testimony that uh, was presented to the Warren Commission, uh, two-thirds of the witnesses said that uh, the fatal shot uh, that killed the president came from the direction of the grassy knoll, the so-called grassy knoll, in front of him where the Warren Commission, the government explanation is that all the shots came from behind the president. Uh, the catch of having shots in front of the president, we know that there were some shots from behind as well, so you have ipso facto two gunmen or a conspiracy. Uh, part of a difficulty uh, with Dealey Plaza is that eyewitness testimony is not the most reliable thing in the world. Uh, people are, get emotionally charged, especially during an incident like that one. So you're looking for what is the best evidence and what is the most cold-blooded kind of evidence. We have lots of uh, uh, photographs. That, it's, clearly, this is the most photographed assassination ever. Mm -hmm. One of the most photographed news sure. events One ever. of the photographs is by a woman named Mary Moorman, and much has been made of that photograph, blown up, enhanced, what have you, that purports to show, and I'm not an expert, so I don't know, purports to show a man with a rifle. He appears to be wearing something like a police uniform at the top of the knoll. Mm -hmm. It appears to have been taken at the instant that he fired. It was taken within a sixth of a second of the shooting. Uh, right now, it is being analyzed outside of the country. We've tried to have it analyzed within the United States, and every time someone's gotten close to finishing an analysis, they get afraid of it. They run away from it, refuse to give a report, return the originals, and that's it. Whether the, uh, the gentleman who appears to be in the photograph is really there or whether it's light or shadow, it's still, after 28 years, too soon to say. Uh, the, uh, the evolution of computer analysis of photographs is now reaching a point where we may be able to do something with it. <laughs> Maybe one of the problems, I, it, there is a tendency to get too hung up in what happened in Dealey Plaza, uh, to spend too much time speculating on how many gunmen were there, what kind of weapons were they using, uh, what, when were the shots fired. The fact of the matter we're is... We're only spending one segment on the, the fact of the matter <laughs> is that the, uh, the evidence that there was more than one gunman is overwhelming. And I think that you've got to get beyond the realm of Dealey Plaza mm -hmm. to find out what was the motivation? We're, we're heading that way. I, I just want to mention one more thing before we go to a break, and that, that's the evidence that, that seems to be suggested by physics. If you watch the Zapruder film, at the instant the president is hit in the head, his head snaps backward. Well, that's, the, what, that's where my starting off point was in this whole case. Back in 1965, the 26 volumes were available. We did not have the Zabruta film in color or in motion. And when you look on the page of those volumes, and of course it's the same thing is true in the film itself, the head after the fatal shot goes back violently and to the left. And I don't see how it's possible to argue that the president can be propelled backwards by a shot from behind. Okay. That was my calculated starting point. rate of acceleration, by the way, was 100.3 feet per second per second. Far faster than a neuromuscular reaction. Uh, the excuse that the so-called other side presents all the time is the car was accelerating. Well, in fact, it was decelerating. Mm -hmm. You can see from the Knicks film from the other side of the street that the motorcycle policeman actually almost overtake it. The mm -hmm. car is slowing down, so that's not an excuse. Okay, we have to take a break now, but when we return, we'll deal with the question of Lee Harvey Oswald in a minute. I, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, do solemnly swear that you will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. That I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. And will, to the best of your ability, and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. Preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. So help you God. So help me God. We're back discussing the assassination of John F. Kennedy. The Warren Commission, of course, blames Lee Harvey Oswald. He was a lone gunman, a fanatic, what have you. He's a somewhat mysterious figure. What do we know about him? Well, you wouldn't know much about him from reading the Warren Commission report. Uh, the Warren Commission alleged that uh, Oswald shot and killed the president acting alone with no outside encouragement or assistance. Uh, According to the Warren Commission, he was a deranged uh, stock boy who wanted to make a, a name for himself. The fact of the matter is that that there was, has been convincing testimony both before the, the Warren Commission and since that the buffs have dug up that Lee Oswald had enjoyed extensive ties to U.S. intelligence. Um, from the time he was in the Marine Corps, which has signed him to a top secret CIA base in the Far East, to his so-called defection to the Soviet Union, which was, what, 59? No. Um, 
uh, to his return uh, to the United States. Um, he's been in and out of the company of uh, people who have clearly have, organ or not organized, but clearly have intelligence fingerprints all over them. Mm -hmm. That sounds you know, sound good to you guys. Yes, it's very important also to know about Oswald that there was uh, a, a concerted effort starting already in 1960 to, uh, to double him. There are at least uh, half a dozen well-documented insta instances on the record starting the earliest in 1960 when he's in the Soviet Union, presumably a defector, in which somebody who could not possibly have been Lee Harvey Oswald was calling himself Lee Harvey Oswald. And these incidences come right up to a few days before the assassination. So th this, is, this guy is a very mysterious figure. He is not by any means the, the solitary, reclusive uh, nut uh, that the Warren Commission wanted us to think he was. And the peculiar thing beyond this is that the Warren Commission very well had this information available to it, very well knew that this was not a lone nut. This was a guy with, with important connections to the intelligence world. Mm -hmm. Indeed, he had a higher security clearance than his own commanding officer when he was stationed at Itsugi Air Base in Japan. And uh, he had uh, a great deal of knowledge of the U-2 spy flights, and this is what he uh, was purporting to give to the Soviets when he defected. Mm -hmm. So this was not some dumb lone nut dropout as we were presented with. It should be, I think, noted as well that this is not something that the buffs, the assassination buffs, have dreamed up. If you take a look at the declassified transcripts of the Warren Commission's executive sessions, they were just as worried as the people who were sitting here are it, that Lee Oswald had connections to American intelligence. Mm -hmm. They were very, very bothered by what he was up to in the Soviet Union, by the fact that he came, returned from the Soviet Union after his so-called defection. And this was at a time when the CIA was interviewing tourists coming home from Yugoslavia. And with this fellow, who uh, had offered to commit espionage on behalf of the Soviets, just passed blissfully back into his country with no problem whatsoever. I mean, there are lots of those things in the background. One thing he doesn't Commission seem to have been is a particularly good marksman, if I'm reading the research correctly, although that was central to the Warren Commission's thesis, that he was actually an expert marksman. Nelson Delgado said that when he uh, was at the rifle range, they would run up the red flag because he'd missed the target completely. They call that Maggie's drawers. Mm -hmm. And he got a lot of Maggie's drawers. The red flag was going up a lot. Something with, like that, uh, yeah. with The Warren Commission made so much of the fact that he was classified as a marksman. Marksman is the lowest acceptable classification you can get than sharpshooter and expert. Mm -hmm. uh, just barely making marksman doesn't make you a good shot. When, uh, when I was in the service, there were a lot of people that could not score very well, and just to get the day over with, they would give them marksman status. Mm -hmm. And the fact um, is, you know, a lot of uh, experts have tried to duplicate Oswald's alleged feat of getting two shots on a moving target at the range of, of about a football field's distance, and nobody has ever been able to do it, even against stationary targets. Mm -hmm. He was firing a rather outmoded gun. Absolutely. A man uh, carbine, I believe yeah. it was, a single yeah. shot. It was, an, it was an Italian army uh, weapon, and the Italians who used it during World War II called it the humanitarian rifle. Because he couldn't kill anybody with it on purpose. It was never known to hurt anyone on purpose. Yeah. Well, was Oswald a patsy, as he at one point claimed in a, in a interview sort of passing through the Dallas Well, I, police I believe he's a complete patsy. And that means I believe that if you sat down with him for a cup of coffee on the morning of November 22nd, 1963, and if we could get into a time machine and speak to him and find out, he would have a story to explain his impressions of who he was and what he's doing in that building. And I believe that when he put his head on the pillow on the night of November 21st, he hasn't the faintest idea that President Kennedy is going to get shot at or anything like that on November 22nd. So clearly in Oswald's life, there's some force some story he's believing that permits him to be moved around in the 18 months before the shooting to all these different cities. He has post office boxes. He makes a trip out of the country to Mexico. Never wants to give his brother his address. Things of that sort are going on. Mm -hmm. There are certain timing problems with his whereabouts on the day. 90 seconds after the shooting, estimate by a police officer who ran into the book depository building, encountered Oswald sipping a Coke on the second floor. That is a very serious incident because the officer runs into the building. If you see films of it, he dismounts, runs right into the building, and he wants to go upstairs. But between the second and the third floor, he's no longer following the building manager who's leading him upstairs. And the building manager comes back to the second floor landing. And there's Oswald at the coke inside a room with a coke in his hand. And the officer has his gun out up against his stomach. And the line I use in lectures is, what was the officer supposed to say? Drop the coke or I'll shoot? <laughs> I mean, the bottom line is that within 90 seconds of the shooting at most, and possibly within 20 seconds of the shooting, a man who 
could have shot Lee Harvey Oswald ended up being his alibi witness for all of those of us who believe he's innocent. He places him definitively on the second floor of the building. All right, when we return, we'll deal with some of the very curious goings on around the autopsy of John F. Kennedy when we come back. our discussion of the JFK assassination. All right, the shooting has happened. JFK is now taken to Parkland Hospital in Dallas. He has a massive head wound. He has a wound in his throat, perhaps a wound in his back. What do the doctors that first get to him see? What do they describe? They describe a wound at the front of the throat, thought to be a bullet's entry. They see basically two holes. He's lying on his back face up. They see a hole in the side of the necktie knot. They see another hole in the right rear of the head. They think the hole in the necktie knot's an entry. They think the one in the right rear is an exit. And they speculate among themselves at the time and in the day following that either a bullet went in here and lodged in the lung and another bullet entered somewhere on the head and blew out the rear. Or maybe one bullet entered here, climbed the spinal column somehow. We know this didn't happen because of the Zebruder film and blew out the back of the head. The film shows us there's two separate events, that these wounds are unrelated. They're not the same bullet. And that's what they thought. The body does not look that way at the time it arrives at, par at uh, Bethesda that night and when the autopsy is performed. Uh, this wound, I can talk about the changes if you want to talk about the changes. Okay, let's take a look. I, I'm no expert, but I've, I've seen the photographs, the drawings, the x-rays, and nothing seems to match. Mm -hmm. The x-rays don't match the pictures, don't match the drawings. We've got, a, we've got some over here. Maybe you can sort of comment. Uh, okay. Anybody just jump in. All right, this hey, is... This a, is what purports to be the, the wound coming through the back of the neck and, and a photograph. In the upper left you have their uh, insert there showing the Warren Commission view of the neck trajectory in the back of the neck, out the front of the neck. And the autopsy photograph on the right showing the little wound uh, at point one there that no one saw at Parkland Memorial Hospital. And one of the doctors actually ran his hands up the back and he said when questioned that he didn't know about any wound. Now, nine years later, someone's come forward and said, oh, I, you know, was told about this wound. But the bottom line is that that's the neck trajectory. And at Dallas, they thought it entered from the front. At Bethesda, uh, they thought it entered from the rear. And regarding that wound number one, the Dallas doctor who did the tracheotomy, Dr. Perry, um, received a call from Commander Humes the morning after the assassination. And he was asked by Humes, did you make any wounds in the back? Mm -hmm. And that's just a fact of the record. And he was very confused by the call and was amazed that the doctor in that Bethesda said to him that the, there was nothing left of the throat wound. All right, this is the x-ray, purports to be the x-ray on the left, and the actual head wound, out of deference to the president, we've blanked out his face, uh, photograph from the autopsy. They don't seem to be the same thing. They're not. The, the wound in the x-ray shows a great deal of damage into the right orbit in the area in front of the, uh, of the uh, just above the eye. The uh, photograph, however, shows no damage there at all. Not only do the wounds in the x-ray and the photographs not match each other, but neither of them match what any of the doctors saw. Mm -hmm. uh, what was said before is absolutely true. The doctors all described, every single one of them, a large exit wound in the rear of the president's head. They said it on the day of the assassination, and they're saying it now. The photographs and x-rays do not match each other. Something is clearly wrong. And the drawings one, clearly just don't... Uh, one one yes. more detail about on the, when the Assassinations Committee of the U.S. Congress looked at this stuff in 1977-78, they, they made a final report acting as if they thought there was a big hole in the front right of the president's mm -hmm. head. And nobody saw anything like that in 1963. This is a this is drawing a on the right of, uh, of the, uh, the president's head, the photograph on the left, uh, they clearly don't match. Well, well, the problem there is, and this is, I, I remember I made a discovery just like this, and this, what happened here was, you have the doc's drawing on the right showing a clearly delineated entry wound at the rear of the head, 
and yet the photograph in the same area doesn't show the wound. And if there was a new investigation, I'd sure like to find out why the artist drew in a wound in effect that was practically in italics mm -hmm. when the well, photograph doesn't show. Okay. What we have here is uh, the area they're calling a wound. There is no definition to it. There's no depth and there's no margin. There's hair growing out of it. All yeah. it is is a piece of dried blood. Um, what happens to the president's body? He leaves Parkland in a bronze casket. He's loaded onto Air Force One, ends up in Washington, D.C. now. Happened? He's what happens then? Well, what happens then is the president's body is brought to Parkland Memorial Hospital. You want to talk about the after, evidence after of Dallas. the intercept? Now it's leaving Dallas. It's now on the, Air Force the One. Air, it is in the president's Washington. body is put into the large casket. It's put on Air Force One. Now, then the plane makes the flight to Washington. In Washington, the coffin is offloaded off Air Force One on national television. To pick up the story of what must have happened earlier than the day, you have to go to the witnesses who received the body. Paul O'Connor in the autopsy room gets the body in a body bag. That's in the House Select Committee's report. Uh, the body was not put in a body bag in Dallas. It was put, it was wrapped in sheets. When I, uh, that report, uh, when I made that discovery at the time, my book, Best Evidence, was about to go to McMillan, and I had to stop publication of the book and go back to the record because there the House report was publishing the fact that the body arrived in a body bag. And I called up the attorney for the House Select Committee and said, did Paul O'Connor say the body was in a body bag? And he said, if I wrote body bag, he said body bag. Mm -hmm. I said, Andy, his name was Andrew Purdy, do you know what a body bag is? And he said, no, what's a body bag? Mm -hmm. And I said, where were you during the Vietnam War? I mean, that's the kind of investigation they conducted, that they had the evidence, circumstantial evidence of an intercept, and they didn't even know what it looked mm -hmm. like. Speculation seems to be that the president was, in fact, loaded off the other side of the plane and perhaps airlifted to Walter Reed Hospital Based on before the, it went to the That's correct. In Best Evidence in Chapter 31, I analyzed the audio tapes and showed that the only possible explanation for why you have the body arriving at Parkland, uh, excuse me, at Bethesda Hospital in one coffin, uh, but a coffin which must have been empty if the body was not, you know, was arrived in a body bag and in a different coffin was that something took place on the starboard side of the plane. And I show the radio transmissions, which I spell out in my chapter 31, how they're talking about going to Walter Reed first. Now, I personally today, in 1991, don't think they went to Walter Reed. There's some other stuff I'm working on. But the fact is that they're talking Walter Reed and they're talking about a ramp on the starboard side of the plane. And one of them says on the radio, we're going to bring the first lady off by that route. Okay, we'll pick up where we left off in a minute after this. They say anything about uh, there being no brain in the... Well, the comment was made that the brain was removed. But to my best knowledge, I don't remember seeing any, any saw cuts or any knife cuts. But uh, it's not saying that it couldn't have been removed. Did you question the purpose of the x-rays you were taking? Yes, I asked, I said, what's the sense of taking the x-rays if there's no, nothing there? He said, well, that's not for you to say. You go ahead and do them. We're back. The assassination of John F. Kennedy. Clearly a lot of strange stuff was going on around this autopsy. We have one more set of slides, Robert, which you reminded me that we have. Uh, we can put them up now. Uh, drawing. Yeah, very simply what this is. On the left is the drawing made for the House Assassinations Committee by Ida Docks. Uh, it purports to show the rear of the head virtually intact with the uh, added entrance wound near the cowlick area. When we were writing High Treason, we brought these, uh, these two drawings, the uh, one on the left from the House Committee and the one on the right, which was done by Dr. Robert McClellan, one of the Dallas doctors. We showed this to 18 of the medical witnesses in Dallas, and every single one of them picked the one on the right, done by Dr. McClellan, as being accurate, depicting the president's head wound. And the one, uh, they all said that the one on the left was not an accurate representation. The House Assassinations Committee report that no shot struck the president from the front was based entirely on the autopsy photographs. We should maybe make the technical point here uh, for people who don't know it is that entrance wounds are typically small and exit wounds are big. So if you see the big hole on the back of the head, that implies the shot came from the front. Bullets tend to flatten out as they pass through a body, tearing a larger hole as they exit. And right. since they, we're they, talking about... They push a lot of mass along yes, with it, too. Yes, a shock wave, in, in a sense. Exactly. Since we're talking about bullets here, and I, I'm, I know I'm moving along in a okay, fast cool. clip, uh, let, let's touch on the single bullet theory at this point. Uh, I want to start talking about conspiracy and cover-up and the, the seeming stupidity of the Warren Commission, for lack of a better word. There was a pristine bullet found on the stretcher at Parkland Hospital, purported to be on uh, Connolly's stretcher. That was the bullet that was meant to have passed through President Kennedy, made a rather odd right turn, and then came, uh, came around again and, and struck uh, Connolly under the armpit, passed through his chest, shattered his wrist, and ended up lodged in his thigh. Exactly. Now that bullet had not a scratch on it. Well, the thing is, with the magic bullet, 
if you give the nature of the known wounds and the timing that we see in the Zapruder film, this has to be the flight path. The bullet strikes the president in the back, leaving a wound of entrance six inches below the point where it hit. It exits the throat, leaving a small, neat wound of entrance. Stops, waits in midair for 1.6 seconds, heads upward and to the right, apparently sees Governor Connolly and says, why not? <laughs> Makes a sharp downward left-hand turn, hits Governor Connolly by the right armpit, fracturing the, the uh, fifth rib, knocking out a three-inch section, causing secondary missiles of bone to flatten and, and, uh, and, and basically almost destroy his right lung. The bullet exits the right side of his chest, leaving the size, a wound the size of an old-style silver dollar, heading again right to left, sees Governor Connolly's wrist to the right, and again says, why not? Makes a right-hand turn, fractures the distal radius bone, one of the densest bones in Governor Connolly's body. Now it's heading out toward the grassy knoll, but then sees his left leg and makes a sharp U-turn. Mm -hmm. Buries itself in his, left, in his left thigh, where it remains until it's surgically removed hours after the single bullet's on its way back mm -hmm. to, to uh, Washington. If nothing else about the Warren Commission report is ridiculous, the single bullet theory is. And that seems to me the linchpin of the Warren Commission. If you don't believe that, yeah, it all falls. then the whole thing falls apart. And Oswald cannot have been the only assassin if he was, in fact, in the sixth floor of the School Book Depository building at all. Now, the, the, the select committee in the House tried to solve this problem by figuring out a faster way to fire the rifle. They decided if you didn't aim it, you could maybe get a shot off in something like 1.7 or 8 seconds, which is still too slow for that time interval. But it was on this assumption that, uh, well, that raises all kinds of other questions. It certainly too, raises a lot of questions. Who put that bullet on the stretcher, for one? It certainly wasn't Lee Harvey Oswald, who was somewhere else. Well, the point is that uh, if you have a body alteration plot, then planting ammunition in connection with a plan to alter the body makes perfect sense. If you don't have a body alteration plot, then you are playing it deuces wild because if you plant a bullet, how are you going to know it's going to fit into the pattern of the wounding? So the only way the planted bullet makes sense is the idea that you are going to create a false impact situation, that you can punch a hole and plant a bullet. But the point that Carl made during the break was that all of this sounds all technical and mechanical. The importance of all of this is that it has a political implication. And that is, once you get away from the lone assassin theory, you get into the question. The reason the commission concluded one man did this and put the puzzle together this way is that they had too many wounds and not enough ammunition. Now, once you do it any other way, you start to question the evidence. And as soon as you question the evidence, whether it's a bullet, a body, or a coffin, or anything like that, you get into who's pulling strings, who's lowering camouflage over the event at the time or within hours of the shooting. And that gets real serious. And that's why there's a direct connection between the analysis of the shooting, which evidence was falsified, and what line of authority was used to phony it. Okay. In addition to that, another bullet was, was uh, signed for at the autopsy. It was found by an admiral, handed over to the autopsist, who handed it over to the, secret, to the uh, FBI. Siebert and O'Neill, the two agents, signed for it uh, for a full missile recovered. That has never been placed into evidence, so we don't know what happened to it or where from the president's body it was removed. Okay, we have to take another break right now. When we come back, conspiracy, cover-up, etc. in a minute. talking about the assassination of President John F. Kennedy with my guests from Esquire magazine, Robert Sam Anson, the author of Best Evidence, David Lipton, Lifton, sorry, and authority on the political aspects of the JFK assassination, Carl Oglesby, and photo researcher Robert Groden. It would seem, gentlemen, that we have a conspiracy here. Uh, who, why, how? Well, I think one of the key ways of getting at this is to examine the assassination just the way the ordinary homicide cops do a, a murder. Who had the motive, the means, and the opportunity to pull it off? and who had the wherewithal to cover it up. Uh, we've established, I think, fairly convincingly, but something uh, rotten was going on with the autopsy. That was conducted under U.S. government auspices. We've also established, I think, fairly convincingly, that Oswald had a relationship with U.S. intelligence. Does that mean that, Os that U.S. intelligence was involved in the assassination? Not necessarily. The fact of the matter is, though, that the government is somehow involved, and it has to be involved because these are the folks who had the wherewithal to cover this thing up. So then you've got to ask yourself, why would they do it? Now, that, I think we get somehow, sometimes too hung up on the details of how this thing worked. The fact of the matter is that how many, however many people were involved, it did work. And why did they? John Kennedy certainly had plenty of enemies out there, but very few of them had the power to cover this thing up. And I th think the, well, personally, I've come to the view that the answer to this lies in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And uh, it has been a myth 
for a long time, but nothing changed in Vietnam because of the assassination, and I think that... Mm -hmm. Carl, we're kind of wandering into your territory here. Well, huh? it's everybody's territory, yes. actually, and the, the fact is that this is the part of the case that's most available to uh, ordinary information. You don't have to be an expert on uh, bullet wounds uh, to, uh, to find out that something very serious uh, changed in American foreign policy with the death of Kennedy and the advent of Johnson. Uh, Kennedy was trying to make some kind of uh, peace with Castro. He was uh, internally trying to make some kind of peace with the civil rights movement, which earned him lots of enemies in, uh, in the South in particular. Uh, the Castro uh, bit, by the way, made him uh, a target for the anti-Castro Cuban community, the exiles who had flooded into the country after the victory of the, the Cuban Revolution in 1959, and who thought that they had a supporter in Kennedy, who, who believed that they would be able ultimately to mount an invasion on uh, Castro's Cuba from the United States, overthrow Castro, and uh, reestablish the system that had existed before, the system in which the Mafia had controlled the casinos and so on. And in, in, in respect to Vietnam, it seems clear that Kennedy had decided sometime in the summer of uh, 1963 that the United States simply could not invest more troops, more material, more money in the attempt to prop up a hated uh, uh, regime in the south of the country. And having tried uh, to a certain de degree to achieve certain results and having failed to achieve those results, now he was going to pull away. This made a lot of people angry with him, too. There were a lot of folks who thought that we needed to fight that war in Vietnam. And it's and not just speculation. There are top secret documents that have been declassified that come from the White House, National Security Action Mem Memorandums, that confirm that, that President Kennedy, six weeks before his death, had secretly ordered the first withdrawal of 1,000 U.S. combat advisors from Vietnam by the end of 1963, mm -hmm. and that they were all to follow by mid-year, I believe, of 1965. Now, that happened six weeks before his death. Then on, uh, on November 20th, 1963, 48 hours before the assassination, the military calls for a massive buildup in Vietnam at a conference in Honolulu. Then on November 26th, when we have a new president in office, Lyndon Johnson, he approves escalatory steps and he cancels the withdrawal from Vietnam. Can we now, put that, any now that is documented, but this is not just speculation from far out crazy paranoid people. This stuff is on black and white uh, in documents and there is no question about it policy was turned on its head because of the assassination. Well, Robert, it was, it was interesting to see, it was interesting that Alan Dulles, who Kennedy has fired as head of the CIA, was the head of the Warren Commission investigating his assassination. Well, there's no excuse that he was made a member of the, of the Warren Commission. Not, not only is this all documented, uh, Robert's being very modest here, his magazine story, in fact, breaks new ground journalistically and reveals for the first time the existence of a major study which is going to be published in January and uh, by an army officer and, about, and a PhD candidate who's probably going to get his PhD within days or weeks on this topic and the uh, book is going to be called JFK in Vietnam and Robert interviewed him extensively uh, and knows all about this and the first information from this manuscript and I'm proud to have been one of about four readers of this manuscript because the author is a close friend of mine is uh, John Newman and I hope you have him on your show when his book is published. <laughs> We'd love to. Is there any